You do have the bios, but I thought I'd give you a little quick highlight of these wonderful ladies sitting on the stage. Among this group, we have a leader announced this week of the one of the top uh, 100 places to work in this country, actually number 44, yes. We have two PhDs, we have a medical degree, we have multiple published authors, we have a pediatric cardiologist. We have a leader in our largest and fastest growing company here, not just in Pensacola, but in the whole region. Um, and really, most importantly, what we have is women who have persevered through their careers to move into leadership roles within industries that are continuing to innovate, and they're here to share their journey with you today. So we will get started with some questions. Um, I want to start by just asking an open-ended question of each of you. If you can, and Debbie will start with you if that's all right. Debbie Calder, uh, our Executive Vice President of Navy Federal here in Pensacola. We also are joined by Dr. Sharon Heiss right here with the Florida Institute of Human and Machine Cognition. I forgot to mention we had an astronautical controls engineer among us. Um, that is her, um, as a tip. Um, we also have Dr. Pam Northrup, CEO of the Innovation Institute, one of the UWF institutes. And then Dr. Mary Mehta, the Chief Medical Officer of Nemours, uh, children's Clinic, who is the pediatric cardiologist, if you hadn't figured that out. Um, but we're going to ask each of them to briefly share their journey, what has brought them to the position that they hold today, and some tips for us on what to do and maybe what not to do that they've learned from their own personal experiences. So Debbie, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm happy to be here today, and I'm really happy when I went to the restroom that I saw a lot of my teammates here today. So. <laughs> Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Um, well, first I have to say my journey, like I think uh, many people, not just women but men, didn't start the way I expected it to. Uh, when I started at Navy Federal 24 years ago, my plan was to work three years, save enough money to buy my bar on the beach in the Outer Banks. Uh, my parents weren't very happy that that was my plan, but that was my plan. and. Um, so that didn't work out quite the way I expected it to, um, but it worked out the way it should have worked out for me. I've had 11 different jobs at Navy Federal, and nine of those I did not choose for myself. A lot of my folks in the audience have heard this, so sorry I'm going to repeat myself. Um, but I have to say my best learning experiences have been the most challenging jobs that I was voluntold to do. <laughs> Uh, have been the best experiences of my career. I learned so much about uh, leadership, but I learned so much about myself. Uh, I learned that you can't do it alone. Um, patience and perseverance have been two things that um, I have learned I need to exercise equally uh, in my daily life um, as well as my career. Uh, perspective, very, very important perspective. Uh, I can go into something thinking one way, and uh, as uh, Judy so eloquent, eloquently put it earlier, is you have to learn how to listen. Um, I too, as a young kid, was somebody who thought I had all the bright ideas and then realized as I got older, no, actually there's people that are much brighter than you and have much better ideas than you. And quite frankly, at Navy Federal, our team members have the best ideas. The best thing I do in my job is I hold employee forums, I do supervisor forums, I have town halls. I learn more from them than they learn from me. And I think that that's been my best takeaway. Um, being authentic, you have to be real. You have to, people have to know that uh, uh, who you are is, is what you are and that you, um, you have an understanding of where they are. I think growing up in the organization, I can honestly sympathize and empathize with them to understand what they're going through. Um, I started out in collections in Navy Federal Credit Union, so collector, collectors are near and dear to my heart because I know how challenging that job is, 
But today, you know, I like to talk to collectors. I go over, I see them, I, I enjoy talking to them about what they do, but they're a lot smarter today than I was when I was a collector. Um, but all the different jobs and experiences that I've had at Navy Federal, I've worked everywhere. I've worked in HR, I worked in lending, I worked in the contact center, and you know, I can tell you a story about my, our, our COO, my boss, who is one of my mentors, has been for years, coming to tell me he wanted me to go take a certain job, and I said, well, I don't want to do that. That's not the job I want. And he very quietly walked over, shut my office door, and he turned around and he said, I really don't care what you want to do. This is what I need you to do. And I thought right there, okay, that wasn't the best strategy. Um, and my dad confirmed that later when I told him the story on the phone. But it was, it was a learning experience, and what I realized was that was the best job that I had. I didn't want to do it because I felt like I had been there, done that. It was a lateral move. It wasn't something that was going to move me up. It was going to move me sideways, but I learned more in that job than any job I've ever had, and I don't think I would be in the role that I am today if it wasn't for that. Thank you. Pam, we'll go to Pam Northrup, how about? Yes, so thinking about the pathway to where I am today and advice and so forth, it would be great if at age about 18, I knew then what I know now, right? I mean, you've heard that your whole life, but I can look backwards and see how different jobs that I've had or different projects that I took on or experiences, whatever that might be, really became the building blocks to where, to where I am today and, and where I hope to continue going in the future. So I started as a classroom teacher. I taught third grade, and that's all I ever wanted to do was teach school. I love kids. I love creativity. I love glue sticks and <laughs> glitter and all. I was that teacher, the one that your child would come home with glitter everywhere because I loved it. It was the creativity. It was exciting. And one day, a janitor rolled um, this thing into my classroom that was a computer. And it was for, I'm looking around and I don't see a lot of people that'll know what this is, but it was a TRS-80. And for those of us um, in the day, that would be called a trash 80, okay? Um, they rolled it in the classroom and said, hey lady, where do you want this? I didn't know what it was, I didn't care. Um, but pretty quickly, we found, I found out that I really loved that. There were no software programs. There was nothing cool about things that we could do in the classroom with it. So I went back to school, school and decided, all right, I'm going to learn how to build that stuff. So I uh, went back and, and went, got my master's degree and learned how to design and develop software and curriculum. And kind of one thing led to another. And I thought, OK, I still miss the classroom, but wow, is this cool. And as I continued to do that, I then just kind of let my pathway, I, I, I kept the drum beat. I love teaching, I love building stuff, you know, the whole glitter thing, I had to let that one go. Um, but but point kind of is, I took the next step, I wasn't scared to do it, I, you know, would question, well, I'm leaving the classroom, I'm going to graduate school, got my master's, okay, well, I'm... I'm going to stay on for my doctorate. And just, you know, my path just kind of ebbed and flowed. I got some exciting opportunities to develop software with IBM. Greatest experience ever. Um, and many other opportunities along the way like that. I ended up at the University of West Florida kind of on a whim. I um, wasn't considering, although I really love teaching, wasn't thinking about, wow, I could be a faculty member. That never, never dawned on me. Um, but I, I decided one day I would look at the Chronicle and there was a job that was at the University of West Florida that was to build a master's program in instructional technology for teachers. I thought, oh my gosh, this is me. And so again, took the risk and um, decided to come here. And I've been here for 23 years. Now I started here when I was seven years old. <laughs> so if you're counting up, I was really, really young. Um, but I've been here for 23 years and just continued on the pathway to not being fearful, to take that next step, and, and opportunities. I've been in several jobs here as well and have gotten the experience 
to stay in one place, which also I never thought I would do. I didn't think about the bar on the beach, but that would have been really cool too. I could have brought the glitter. We could have done the, yeah. That, so, um, but that, just, just being here and staying in one place, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people move to different organizations as they move up and move around. And I've had the absolute ability or excitement to get to stay here and to learn from, I loved the, the conversation about mentors and learning from great mentors right here at the University of West Florida and learning how to be a leader, learning how to be on teams and recognize that there were, and you know, people that were way smarter than me and people that weren't in my discipline that I could learn from. And so, you know, as you're thinking about next steps and what you do and how you, how you begin to form your pathways, I think other than the fact that realize you're not the smartest person in the room and that there's gonna be other people you learn from and working on teams is incredible. It's the way to take things and really move it forward. But it's also be, be willing to take those risks, but at the same time, listen to your drumbeat of what it is that your passion is and just always try to make decisions that get you to that place. And, um, and just recognize that, that there are other people around you. I, you know, I, I, I can think of hundreds of experiences where I went into a meeting thinking, oh my gosh, I figured it out. I've got the answer. I know what we're going to do. I lay it out. I put it on the board or whatever. And someone would say, you know, if you move that there and you did this like this, and before we know it, we have a solution that is exceptionally better by having multiple people working on it than you would ever do on your own. So. Great. Thank you, thank you so much, Pam. We'll move on to Sharon. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, well, I set goals early. I was gonna be an astronaut. Who didn't wanna be an astronaut when they were a child, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so then I set about planning. I was going to study aeronautics and astronautics. I was going to go into the Air Force. I was going to be a pilot. I was going to get a PhD. And then I was going to be either a pilot astronaut or a mission specialist astronaut. Well, that's clearly not why I'm up here this morning, <laughs> this <laughs> afternoon. So. so as any good military commander knows, and I was in the military for 20 years, plans rarely survive contact with reality. <laughs> So you always have to be willing to replan. And so I've been constantly replanning for my entire career. Because, you know, the adage where one door closes, another one opens, it really is true. And you just need to put one foot in front of the other and keep on looking for doors that are opening. Now, in my military career, I moved around a lot, lived a lot of places, had a lot of jobs, just like all of us up here. And that meant that I met a, met a lot of people, and people were constantly moving through my life, people from all over the world. And I've kept contact with those people. And in each of my jobs, and I had a lot of fabulous jobs in the uh, Air Force Research and Development community, in each of those jobs, I never ever got a job other than by word of mouth. It was always somebody recommending me, somebody pointing me towards a job. So those people that you encounter throughout your life, it's very important to keep them, because they will be there for you. People ask me a lot, well, you know, what brought you to Pensacola? Well, exactly the same thing. I had an office director at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency who was on the Science Advisory Council at IHMC who mentioned to Ken Ford, our CEO, that, hey, I think this individual is thinking of retiring from the Air Force. You might want to consider talking to her. And he did. We had breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. And he observed me in all sorts of different, every possible, every possible social and professional setting. Very clever man. <laughs> <laughs> and so I came to Pensacola for the job. I've been here almost 10 years now. It's the longest I've ever kept a job. <laughs> and uh, it's also the first opportunity I've ever had to set down roots somewhere. And I'm planning to stay. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Mehta. OK. Well, I was sort of the same thing. I was a scientist. I was hell-bent to go to medical school. 
And, you know, I knew what I was going to do, a family medicine doctor. And then I met my husband. I sort of convinced him that we could do family medicine together. We got our, our residency together. And about halfway through the year, we looked at each other and go, I don't think this is what we want to do. <laughs> you know, I, I like I wanted to do everything. But when we started talking to those mentors out in the community, family medicine, what we were training to do, working late at night, bumping into cars, trying to go home, sound asleep uh, in the morning, was that wasn't what they were really going to get to do. So we were killing ourselves in um, residency to learn to do stuff that the real world would not let us do. And so, believe it or not, we changed um, and said, well, I know what I want to do. And so we found another spot together and we changed our plans. And then I took him kicking and screaming to uh, South Miami in the heat of Miami Vice days to say, because I'm going to be a pediatric cardiologist. And we were in New Orleans at the time. And yes, he had, you know, saddle shoes and uh, Argyle socks on. He goes, I cannot go to Miami. Yes, you can. We're going. And uh, so I did my fellowship in peds cardiology. And then we went to practice. And I kept being put into these situations that said, we've got a problem over here. Can you go try to mediate between these two doctors and or this two groups? And so I went from doing very much clinical care to working of helping groups of physicians, which some of us get a little high and mighty, just like some scientists. There's only one way to do it, and it's my way. And how can we work to be a better? And really, healthcare has become more of a team sport. And it's, um, it's just what they've said in there. It's not just the way I can see it to do. It's how we all can work together to do what's best for the patient. And I think that was clear when I uh, got recruited to move up here. And I was just doing my thing, doing clinical care and had some leadership roles. And there was two big factions that were about to separate ways that would have been um, a really tremendous impact to here in Pensacola. And um, so my mentor, the same thing, I was voluntold, uh, we need to go patch this up and I think you ought to be on that board and you ought to fix this. Uh, me, I don't have time to be on this board and I sure can't fix that problem. And sure enough, it worked out and um, all things came to fruition and the Ronald McDonald House is still sitting on the campus of Sacred Heart. They have not moved off. It's a beautiful facility that all people who are traveling a very long way for health care are able to be close to their um, children and they have a, we have a very good relationship now. So what you start off doing, it's okay to make a turn, it's okay to change what you're doing and take that next job that they're encouraging you to do. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, so I think so far my quote for the day is that plans rarely survive contact with reality, right? So I think we can each think about how has that been true in our lives, maybe even just this week, right? Or today even. Um, so as we think about that, and I think we heard a lot about making plans early, being open to course correction, not really knowing not only what the right answer is or the right way to proceed with something, but what's ahead for us as individuals. Um, tell us, what has surprised you the most about your career? And as you're thinking about that, let's weave in, has being a woman, since we are at the Women in Leadership Conference, had any direct impact on that path for you or maybe the way you've perce perceived your potential path within your own journey? We'll start, let's go right to you first, Mary. Is that all right? Sure. Um, yes, it, and I uh, picked a career of ultimately a peds cardiology that was very um, male dominated and had to deal with surgeons. Surgeons tend to be a, a little bit uh, dogmatic about the way they deal with things. And so a lot of times I was felt like I had been put in between two um, alpha males, whatever you want to say, to help mediate the situation. And so in my situation, it really helped because I was able to pull somebody down off the ledge, sit down, listen. One of the biggest, hugest things that you can do, especially when you've got two people in front of you that are have no intention of ever working together in their entire life. <laughs> and needless to say, they don't even breathe the same oxygen as the other person. And how to make that work and what's in best interest for the patient, your organization, that's a really big success. And I think that they came in the room thinking that they were going to intimidate me, but it's all about what Carol said. It's communication, keeping your cool, not letting them get you flustered, and listening 
and maybe call into truth and say, okay, we've done all we can do today. Let's, let's try again tomorrow or another time. So um, not accepting defeat, but accepting to taunt, and we're going to go and do something else now. <laughs> Well, I guess what surprised me the most in my path here, and I think I've already mentioned it actually, is the, um, the role that luck plays throughout your course of life. Okay? They say that luck is preparation meeting opportunity. And I think that that's a very true thing. Because preparation, well, that's my responsibility, right? Opportunity, that's what was often provided by the people that I ran across in my careers. And um, so I just feel, you know, luck lucky to have met the right people who have eventually pointed me to where I am um, now. And uh, I heard a story about Dr. Seuss once about how when he wrote his first children's book, he went to 20 publishers and it was turned down. And um, one day he was walking down Madison Avenue and ran into an old classmate who was uh, at a publishing house. And just this piece of luck got his first book published. If he'd been walking on the other side of the street, he might be changing car batteries, <laughs> or might have been changing car batteries. So as far as being a, 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 you know, a female during this, this process and how that's affected me, well, I'm in the science and technology field. And um, while I think that we can all agree that both men and women can equally contribute to and succeed in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, so we're still evolving away, I think, from a societal gender bias, okay? So there's that to deal with. But it's happening, and we're seeing more and more women in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And we definitely add value to the innovation process because diversity is all about different perspectives, different backgrounds, different skill sets. So not everybody needs to see everything the same. Not everybody needs to communicate in the same way. But diversity definitely adds value to the innovation process. Does that sort of do it? Okay. Yes. Pam, your perspective. Yeah, so I've, I've thought about so many different things that I might say, but I, you know, there's something that keeps coming into my head that culture eats strategy for lunch. And so, you know, so when I've moved into some leadership roles and actually one that I'm, I'm working on right now, um, you, you go into a, a place where you are the person that is responsible to clean up the fill in the blank or to do whatever to turn the ship, ride it into the right direction. Um, and it's one of the state level activities that we have underway at our institute. I thought, fine, you know, I can write a vision, mission, whatever. I can go in and do this, and I know what performance metrics are, and I know how to do all of this. And you get this great big plan. Walk into the door, and people are just mean. Um, and, you know, they were, they were mad about this and mad about that. And, you know, and, and it has taken us probably two years working with this organization that we're working with to begin to really build the climate in a very positive way that's going to shape the culture so they can get about the business of what they're trying to accomplish. And that has been, I think, the biggest surprise for me. I had led a college, I had done all these things, and, um, <clears throat> and this was just about more than I understood. But the notion of culture in an organization and, I mean, you know, you look at it from the perspective of the female. So, so you know, certainly I was responsible for this. Um, but it really didn't matter if I was a male or a female. They were just mad about everything. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that I, I think that the fact that I am a female, I was going to say that I was a female, I still am, um, I think. Um, the fact that I am a female, I think, you know, somehow empathy starts to play a role. And I think that's almost like an extra gift in the sense for people that really have empathy for people and really have empathy for the organization. You can start seeing things that help, that help you to understand what makes people tick. And then really, then you can get into, you know, what's your passion and, and, and help people get into the right seats so that they can do the best job for what they're doing. So I think that's been the biggest surprise for me, that, you know, culture, go figure, it matters a lot. Yeah. 
Well, if I had to talk about probably one of the big things that surprised me over my career, we, we have a motto at Navy Federal. Um, it's it's do the right thing by your by your employees, and they'll take care of your members. And we've always practiced that. We also have um, very structured job descriptions. You know, your job description, 95% this. And then there's 5% at the bottom that says other duties as assigned. <laughs> well, we all laugh at Navy Federal, especially in leadership ranks, to say, well, it should be flipped. 95% other duties as assigned, 5% your real job. And, and so my example is when I came down to Pensacola to, to take on this role. It's evolved greatly over the last eight and a half years. But one of the things that happened in 2009 was we were running out of space, we were, we, and we wanted to continue to grow in Pensacola. Uh, we never thought we'd grow this much. It was gonna be one building, 300 people, that's it. Um, those were my folks at the time. I was coming down here every quarter to visit them. And then we were realizing, what a phenomenal talent pool in Pensacola. This is where we need to grow. So building after building. And it, there was no strategy involved. It's like, oop, we're running out of space. Let's build another building. Running out of space, build another building. Um, so I was talking to, you know, my boss, our CEO, Cutler, one day. And we were standing um, actually in um, one of our buildings looking out at the 4-H property. And he's, because we talked about the Navy field next door, of course, that was going to be a long term, way beyond the point where we needed space. And he said, you know, if that ever becomes available, he said, maybe we should, you know, look into seeing if we can get that. And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. So I knew Pam Allen, who was the director over there. I invited her over for lunch the next week. I mean, I took that as basically, that's a directive. That wasn't just a thought, that was a directive. So I invited her over for lunch. We talked, and so she starts enlightening me. Well, you know, actually, we do need a smaller space. We're using about 10% of this property. We're thinking, you know, we need a smaller space, but their biggest thing was funding. So we started having conversations. Next thing I know, I'm in the throes of a meeting a year and a half down the road. I'm, I am in, in a board meeting of nine to 12-year-olds trying to convince them to sell us their property. And in the meantime, I have my peers at headquarters ch chiding me, saying, you're taking away land from children. How could you do that? And it really was a very, it was a trying time because I really was feeling, you know, hey, if they don't want to do this, if these kids don't want to do this, then we're not going to push the envelope. And people were saying, well, of course, you know, the, the county commission can step in and override them. They're the trustees. And I said, but that's not the right thing to do. We're not doing that. People thought we were crazy to take that position. They thought we were crazy to say, if the kids won't sell it to us, if they vote no, we will just walk away. We'll expand somewhere else. And there were people who really wanted to get in the middle of this and we had to kind of hold them back and say no. Of course, the whole time I'm standing there like this with my fingers crossed, hoping, and it was close. I mean, I remember that night when they were doing the votes, the kids were doing the votes, and I was actually not there because I said, I'm not gonna, I don't want to be there while they're doing the vote. I don't want to be standing there going, come on, vote for us, vote for us. <laughs> Um, so I was actually at home and somebody from the chamber was there and, and he was calling me, well, it's like seven to two right now. And now it's a, you know, and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm sitting here doing this. This is my job that I am actually trying to see if nine to 12 year olds are going to vote. And I'll tell you, there was the, the kid who was 17 years old and was the president of the 4-H, uh, association came to see me about a week before that. And I'll tell you, he was wise beyond his ears. And he said, I'm coming to see you because we have one side over here, mostly parents, who really don't want to sell this. We don't know. We're children. We don't know enough to know what are you going to do with this property. And are you going to take care of this property? Are you going to take care of the wetlands? And are you really going to create good jobs? So I told him, that's our plan. I'm not going to lie to you. We're, our plan is to create jobs. If we can keep growing, keep growing members, we're going to grow jobs. And he went back, and I, I, I'm convinced that he was able to convince them that we were going to do the right thing. Because we've always tried to do the right thing. But it was the most surprising part of my career, I can tell you that, that I was ever involved in that. But it was a great experience. It really was a great experience. And we're very happy to, we're, we have a great partnership with 4-H, and we're happy to see that they're even a better place right now than I think that they were, they were before. They have an even more beautiful piece of property, and they've got a lot of programs going on. But from being a, a woman, my perspective is, 
I've never felt that it's been a barrier. I've never felt that, I've never felt like I walked in the room going, oh my God, I'm in here with a bunch of guys. Never felt that way. Um, but I will tell you that I do think women on average, at least my experience, we operate more out of, off of gut instinct, I do anyway, than somebody throwing a bunch of numbers in front of me, analytics and saying, well, this is why we need to do this, Debbie. I will always look at that, but I will also listen to my gut and say, okay, well, my experience tells me that might not work the way the numbers tell me it's gonna work. So that's only been my only kind of takeaway being a woman. Fantastic, thank you. All right. Yes. So as you've been listening, if you've been thinking of any questions, we'd like to open it up now to you. Anybody have questions for our panelists? If you do, if you can just come up to the mic here. The first one is always the hardest. <laughs> We have a woman moving. Oh, oh she's oh. leaving. We'll see you in a minute when you, on your return. Excellent. All right, great. So my name is Jasmine. Um, I'm in a bit of a gray area because I took college classes in high school. So like sometimes I say I'm a junior, but I'm kind of a senior or I'm a sophomore kind of a junior. <laughs> so gray area. Um, I am a sales management major, and as a kid, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I always said I wanted to be your boss. That didn't sit well with the other kids, but it might happen. Um, so I always knew I wanted to do business. Problem is, there's a million things you could do in business. So like my problem is for like juniors, seniors, super seniors, what advice can you give to someone trying to like narrow down their career paths? like narrowing down what you want to do. So I can say like, when I grow up, I really want to do this. Great question. Who'd like to okay. tackle that? Is that, that for me? Yeah. Or is that for anybody up here? Anybody. Oh. anybody. Do I stay up here? Yes, please stay. Okay. We'll have it as a conversation with you. Debbie, you I, I will just add, and I'm sure others, you know, be adaptable. You just have to be open to doing anything. Um, I think from my perspective, like I said before, the things that I thought were gonna be either the most boring or not really a challenge or were lateral moves were the best things I ever did. Uh, be open-minded and especially if somebody that has more experience than you says to you, I think you'd be great at this, try it. Try it, even if it's something you think is totally off the mark. I think you'd be surprised at how many different things you can be good at. And I, it's hard for me not to want to put an advisor hat on, so because I am here at the University of West Florida. But what, you know, in addition to that, I think if you've got opportunity and time while you're still in college, go visit some businesses. Um, try to do an internship, get out there so you can see if there's something that you kind of like but you're not really sure, go try it out while you're still in college because you can get some college credit for it or you can write a paper for it. Talk to your advisor, um, talk to people in your department and see if, see if they can help connect you with some awesome people that are in this community to just let you try some things out while you're still in school. Okay. I'm sorry, I have to say something because you said business, so I can't let you sit down without saying this. When you look at the actual job market, I will tell you that today a general business degree is not as useful as a more technical degree like finance or accounting or marketing or one of the business disciplines. And also know that this is not a forever decision. Don't feel the weight of that. Um, you will have more opportunities, more doors to open up, as Sharon referred to, if you do have a more deep technical knowledge in an area of business and don't feel like that that commits you to that discipline for the rest of your career. It gives you a way to get in and to be a little bit more competitive in a very uh, competitive job market right now. So I would recommend you know, really understanding what those different disciplines of business are, learning a little bit more, maybe specializing to get an actual degree in one of those specialized areas. And then as you get in, understand, you will just build on that entry level skill set to define your own career path that will likely take you through various areas of business um, and maybe even um, outside of the business realm as well. <laughs> You know, when you're the power company lady sitting on the stage <laughs> and lights go out. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> did you see me? I did quickly notice, though, that the other lights didn't, so I thought I've done that before. I've been the person leaning on the switch. I hope that's helpful for you. Oh, yes. Um, I'm a sales management major, mostly Fantastic. marketing. Fantastic. 
mostly marketing, but like my advisor said, you, there's no major for CEO, so I did the closest. That's right. That's right. Well, you have to start somewhere, and yeah. and we do have internships, um, and it could be a CEO internship. You never know. That's what I'm hoping for. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Questions. All right. Oh, this is a great one. Oh, we ha we have one. Would you like to come on, come on up? Come on up. Good afternoon, ladies. I'm Ashley Hodge Harris with Baptist Healthcare. Um, one thing I've noted throughout your talks today um, is that one, you're happy to take on projects for your toll, broaden those skill sets and the impact you can do. Two, you're willing to get outside of your comfort zone to really test your limits, test your abilities in terms of learning new skill sets. Um, and a lot of women leaders that I know in this community, they really have that going on for them. My question to you is though, at what point in time does that get it, get it done for all um, mantra turn into taking on more responsibilities without appropriate corresponding compensation? And let me, let me, uh, I know every lady in the room likes the question. Let me, let me phrase this in a way of, when I mean compensation, it's not about having more money to spend on more stuff, it's about defining your value and so I, I find that, particularly maybe in the Southeast, you know, when you're trying to define that value against your male peers, you know, how do you stay apples to apples? Um, and then how do you make that ask without seeming inappropriate um, and or um, not appreciative of your organization and what they've given you thus far? I think that's one of the hardest things that um, that we do, women, when we're um, because we do volunteer a lot for those jobs because they do seem exciting to us, and it's a new challenge. It's, we're just chronic learners, is what we're doing. But when you move up and you sort of you know what your peers are getting. And it, it's, it's always been a challenge for me of trying to say what my value is worth, but yet I also want my company to succeed. And that's tough. And I don't know if I'm so good at it, really, even now. I keep working on it every time, but uh, I don't know if I'm really good at it, even at this level. Well, it's extremely tough. I mean, you know, whether... I, you're trying to balance against maybe what male counterparts are making and there's a reality to that that's still associated these days in a lot of discipline areas. I think when you sometimes there's I thought you were going for work-life balance so that's what I thought you were going for um, but so so I was thinking in that respect but the idea that you take on new projects sometimes um, if it moves you up in the organization, compensation, of course, is, a, is, is, is an appropriate and extremely appropriate conversation to have with your boss. Sometimes the project may be other duties as assigned that you're taking on, not, maybe not just because it's the other duties as assigned, but because you want to learn a new skill because eventually you want to be that CEO. Um, and as you've got those building blocks that you're building along the way, so, some, you know, I think you have to be very purposeful when you take on a new responsibility and have that conversation with your boss. And I know people have had conversations with me when I ask them to do something. I hate, them, I hate it when they come to me with this, but it's, okay, what do you want me not to do if I'm going to do this? And, um, but the reality is you have to have that conversation because it may be above and beyond your workload. Maybe sometimes you need to shift some responsibilities around or sometimes you need to have that frank conversation with your boss that you're taking, you're going to a new level with your job. And with that new level and those additional responsibilities, some compensation might make sense. And so I think you have to be frank and honest, but present a really good argument, um, but recognize which thing you're balancing. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, Sherry, I would like to know, we have quite a few questions about where to find mentors. So hopefully we'll be able to talk about the mentor program again, um, as well as maybe some other opportunities that are available through University of West Florida, yes? And there's information in the program as well um, that hopefully will help you. Um, I do want to ask this question, and I think it goes back, Debbie, to something you said early about being authentic. Uh, most of you spoke about being in male-dominated fields, 
how did you all stay true to yourself while leading and working with men? Um, so I think I'd like to broaden that question beyond just when with working with male counterparts, but really as you ebb and flow, we've talked about the moves and course corrections in our careers and that nothing really has panned out as any of us ever would have thought it would. How do you stay authentic to yourself, particularly as maybe your personal life changes as your career is changing at the same time? So how do you remain true to yourself and continue to navigate your way through um, to the leadership roles that you're in now? You want me to start? Um, well, you know, I guess if I had to, from a authentic perspective, my, my two biggest mentors probably in my life were definitely my father, my dad, and John Peden, who's our COO. Because since I've been growing up in the organization, he's been the one who's kind of plucked me from places and threw me somewhere. Um, and put me in very uncomfortable positions that I didn't think I would be good at. So. Right from the start, you know, I was moving up fairly quickly into leadership roles. I was always a minority woman in a leadership role. There's still, you know, on our management council. There are um, 12 of us that are on management council and three of us are women. Much more women in the, in, in the leadership ranks below that. But I can't ever say that I've had this feeling of you know, it's us versus them kind of feeling, probably because of that, because I've had this strong mental relationship with my dad and a very strong mental relationship with the guy who's the COO now, who in his own way of doing things and, and, and volun you know, volunteering me uh, to do things, showing confidence in me. I, so I never felt like there was this, you know, you're inferior uh, kind of perspective, but I mean, that's, I mean, I don't know if I'm a answering the question or not, but that's kind of my perspective on it. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, I was thinking more of, of a different way that I heard that was um, people, I said volunteering me or doing it, and it was really taking what the way they told me to go do it and then changing it from what I thought as a woman would be the better way to do it. So especially in uh, medicine, um, this happened quite often from male physicians of saying, you just march right in there and tell them what to do, and they'll do that. And that, that didn't work for me. And, um, but I listened, and I learned from their perspective and really could transfer that over, especially if it was men that I was going to need to go and talk to. But I was able to soften it. Um, not soften it, but with strength, because I was a bossy lady too. You know, I'm telling you what you need to do, and they work for me. But it also was, it was very rewarding to me that after we came through that thing, that they would come, boy, I'm really glad I worked for you. That was, that's a big compliment for me. We have another question. I do think we are coming close to the end of our time. I do want to say when I look out in the audience, we do have a lot of folks at different stages in careers. Um, and I think since we have such different industries and companies represented, I'd like to close with the question of what kind of traits are you looking for in employees? Maybe both that you're bringing in new to the organization, but also as you're looking to identify that next generation of leaders and in industries that are consistently innovating and changing and course correcting themselves. What are you looking for in employees, both for new folks as well as those to grow into leadership now? Go ahead. Well, I can start. Okay, so uh, I'm from IHMC and uh, we are a, a research institute full of scientists and engineers and mathematicians and psychologists and medical doctors and a whole bunch of people that refuse any attempt to categorize them. Um, <laughs> And uh, we are constantly in the process of innovation. That's what research is. We're always trying to do something new, whether it's a, uh, uh, whether it's a theory or whether it's a device or whether it's a, pr a process. We're always trying to do something new. Well, that means that we're frequently going to get it wrong. And that's okay, okay? It's okay if you learn that something is a bad idea. Because, uh, you know, eventually you'll get to something that's a good idea. So what we look for in people is we look for people who are willing to fail and who won't then take no for an answer. And we're looking for leadership that are willing to let their people fail. As long as their people are resilient 
So resiliency is another thing that we look for. People that will pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and try it all over again. So persistence, we're looking for persistence. People that are gonna walk in the door and in the morning and say, today is gonna be the day when everything works right. And usually, they're wrong. <laughs> but <coughs> eventually, inevitably, they're gonna do something great. And so those are just some of the things that we look for in people. Um, so for us, the Innovation Institute is, I mean, innovation. So in the sense that we're always thinking about the next kinds of people that come together. And our organization was formed not just with people that were exactly alike. We have brought in people with a lot of different perspectives from many dis different disciplines. And our projects kind of ebb and flow. So when we have a project that's a higher ed project, we bring in experts in higher ed. When we have a project that is completely another industry and we're working with a lot of different industries, we'll bring in experts in that area as well. But we have a common set of people that are innovation consultants. And those are the people that I would probably hire on a more permanent basis. And for them, it, it's some of the same things. I mean, it, it, when you are working on projects, if someone has done it before, that's not what we do. So the opportunities are going to be there. I mean, it's, I mean, we always talk about failing early, failing often, and designing your way through it so that you can get to that successful completion, whether it's a new product or a new process or whatever, whatever the project happens to be at the time. And so the people that we bring in, it's very similar. They need to be, of course, very passionate, uh, resilient, recognize that they can fail, and then push their way through it to success, but also need to be very self-directed in the sense that when you come to your job at the Innovation Institute, there's definitely a position description, but it doesn't tell you at 9 o'clock you do this and at 9.45 you do this. You are working on big, hairy problems and trying to bring in all the right knowledge, skill, and ability to solve those problems. So we need people that are flexible um, <clears throat> and people that, you know, that can adapt to change very easily. As a physician um, interviewing other physicians or staff members, one of the, um, I'm already assuming, and I've seen their CV, I know what their skill level is and where they've been. My biggest question that I um, usually ask of them is describe a situation where you are as a physician in there and how you made the other team members feel that they could contribute to taking care of that patient. Because if they can't work in a team-based organization or it's my way or the highway, that's not, the, that's not who I'm looking for. So it's got to be team-based. Uh, well, at Navy Federal, you know, first and foremost, they have to fit our culture. That's very important. And, and the biggest part of our culture, our identity, is having a passion for our mission, which is serving those who serve our country. Um, and that's pervasive in our organization. And you pretty much, our supervisors and managers who hire people, they get a pretty good gut instinct if somebody can get that right off the bat. They need to be adaptable. They've got to be somebody who's going to give as much to their team members sitting beside them as they are to their members on the phone or at a branch or if they're in lending back office operation and, uh, you know, a manager from Guam calls in the middle of the night and says, I need you to help me get this loan for the sailors getting ready to get on a ship. They're going to do whatever they need to do to get that done. Um, that's going the extra mile. And I think, you, you know, we get a sense of, of what we want, but we cultivate that every day in the organization. It's not just bringing them on board. It's, it's doing everything we need to do to develop them. And part of that development is, is on their own shoulders. It's building their own social capital uh, and networking and, and understanding that if your team member sitting beside you knows that you'll do something for them, it, it's, it's amazing. There's a great quote, one of my favorite quotes um, by Harry Truman is, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. And that is truly what we try to live by at Navy Federal. So. Fantastic. Thank you. I'll add another quote that I heard yesterday. Um, Winston Churchill apparently was asked to come speak to a class. Given a full hour, he slowly walked up on the stage, stood on the stage and said, never give up, never give up, never give up. 
And he went and sat down. And the professor walked over to him and said, I'm sorry, sir, we gave you the full hour. He said, there's nothing else I can say. I have told them everything they need to know in life to succeed. So I think we have learned today from these women that they absolutely never gave up. I know we've all taken quite a few nuggets from them today. Thank you for sharing your journey and your wisdom with us. Please help me in congratulating them and thanking them for being with us today. Thank you.